Well, hi, everybody. Welcome um, to Pockets, Pouches and Secret Drawers, um, a three day virtual conference which is hosted by the Institute of Modern Languages Research. Um, so my name is Anna Jameson. I'm an early career researcher and art historian, and I specialise in representations of gender and illness in the 18th century. And pockets have become um, a part of my research over the last six months or so. So I'm really delighted to um, have co-organised this conference with Naomi and I'm delighted to see you all today. Um, so we have three days of papers um, starting from today going to Saturday afternoon and they span a very broad range of topics and themes. Um, today we're going to have three panels, two taking place at the same time um, and our first keynote um, will be later this afternoon from Jack Ashby. And um, in a moment, I'll be posting some links into the chat um, to direct you to the program and our sort of speakers information. A few practical things, um, and I'm sure everyone's pretty used to Zoom by now, um, but I will just go through some housekeeping. Each session will have both a chair and a technical host. But if you have any sort of burning technical issues, um, you can get in touch with Jenny Stubbs. Um, I'll add her contact details or her email into the chat in a moment. Um, Something to bear in mind is that, as is often sort of tradition with these conferences, we'll be taking questions at the end. So we'll have a couple of papers or three papers um, and you'll be muted until then. Then when we have our Q&A, the chair will call upon you to either unmute and ask your question um, or, you could, or you could pop it into the chat as well. Um, sessions won't be recorded, but the keynotes will. Um, and a quick note actually say that the schedule for tomorrow has changed slightly. You may have seen this alteration as it has been sent around in updated programmes, um, but we'll be opening the Zoom rooms from 9.40 tomorrow and the first sessions will start at 10 a.m. And before I hand over to Naomi, just a reminder that on Friday, we'll be having a 45 minute keynote magic performance. And that's tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. with Ashton Carter. Um, Ashton has asked everybody, and this information has been circulated, but just as a reminder for those joining us, and I hope many of you can, um, Ashton has asked everyone to explore your own pockets, pouches, and secret drawers at home. So have a hunt for forgotten, in forgotten drawers or in odds and end boxes or your winter coat pockets and pick four objects that are small enough to place in front of you during the performance. And please bring with you either a ball of string or a reel of cotton, um, a pair of scissors and a metal object with a hole through it, like a finger ring or a key or a large washer. Um, so I'm very excited to see what Ashton is gonna cook up for us tomorrow afternoon. So I think that's everything from me for now. Um, so I'll hand over to Naomi. Thanks very much, Anna. Um, I think everybody knows everything, but just in case they don't, um, or, you know, you can ask at any time. And if it's practical, ask Jenny, please. Um, so I'm going to do a little uh, introduction to where the idea for this conference came from, because occasionally I get people saying, oh, how did you put those things together? And what a nice idea, and da, da, da. So I'm going to set it up a little bit with some examples of where I got the ideas from. So the idea for the conference first sprang up when I was the director of the Institute of Germanic and Romance Studies, the original name for what is now the IMLR. And I've been searching back and I found an email dated 13th of March 2007, if any of us can remember back that far, which I sent to Carolyn Sargentson, who was my original inspiration. I'll tell you a bit more in a moment. And also to a Paris-based colleague, and, and I wrote in this email, Longer ago than I care to remember, we discussed the germ of a conference which would optimally, peripatetically be run by IGRS and the V&D in London and ULIP and the Louvre in Paris on something like mémoire matériel corps objet lieu, which means uh, material memories, bodies, objects and places. Um, I think the idea in my head, I said in this email, was nearer to pockets, pouches and secret drawers, pun semi-intended, which was to fit into an IGRS core program on something like space or inner space. So at that point, it was vaguely penciled in for 2008, which is actually 13 years ago. And that was the first jump in time. You can see quite a long one. And then the first version of what became this happy event was planned for December 2020. And the smaller jump um, to a year after that was, of course, based on the pandemic. And that brings us to now when we're delighted to welcome you to this very exciting programme. But there are three other earlier inspirations. The first, as I mentioned, was Carolyn. 
We first met at the AHRC, uh, the Funding Council for the Arts and Humanities in this country, um, and we were on the same committee and just got talking. And she then invited me to the VN Day, where she, I think at the time, she'll correct me if I'm wrong, if she's there today or tomorrow, she was head of research. And she'd done her PhD on 18th century Paris furniture. So when I went to see her there, she took me down to see a number of old desks and bureaus. And they, many of them had these sort of magic switches and drawers that sprang out and could be carried on the travels of the lady or the duchess or the queen that the bureau belonged to. There was one with a matching pair of removable shelves. And each one of these shelves had 28 sections in it wooden divided up like almost you could put a finger in each one um and she was telling me about a, a class she'd run on this these pop-out shelves and she talked to her students and her students had been invited by her to suggest what could this what could these things be for they would probably be taken on a journey and why um, and bit by bit, they, people suggested coins or rings or all sorts of things, and nothing seemed quite right. And then one of her clever young students said, there are 28 of these, so maybe it's a kind of contraceptive device. And in each one of these, you'd have a different amount of a different kind of herbs, which would count for that evening of the entire 28-day cycle. Now, uh, she's re she's reminded me that nobody knows if that was the right answer at all, but it was just rather a good one. And it's an example of the kind of curiosity that these things provoke. So the two other sources of my own fascination with uh, furniture go back a bit earlier. In 1976, I was a jun junior research fellow in Oxford at St Anne's College, and it was my good luck to be given a set of rooms that had belonged to a fellow in medieval studies before me called Elaine Griffiths. had a beautiful balcony with honeysuckle on it. It was actually a lovely set of rooms. And in part of this was Oh, I also just mentioned that I discovered that this was actually part of a house in a street called Bevington Road, and that my bathroom turned out to be the front door of that street with a beveled window, fortunately. Upstairs in the main room, then, was a wonderful ornate wooden desk which had loads of parts that opened. Mostly they looked like drawers, but others seemed part of the uprights between the drawers. You could take them out and find things inside them. And inside one of them, I found a postcard to Dr. Griffiths from J.R.R. Tolkien, who I've now discovered was her PhD supervisor. Thus, I was reminded that a hidden drawer always contains something curious for the curious. And indeed, I'd thought this for some time because I did 19th century French at both at school and university. And I was fascinated by the Maupassant story of a hank of hair, which Céline, if she's there, is going to be speaking about um, in her session. Um, and also by the guiding metaphor in Baudelaire's spleen poem number 76, where the poet's sad brain is a great bureau full of hidden things, documents, verses, love letters, tresses, and this bureau is then compared in turn with a pyramid, a vault, a graveyard, a boudoir heavy with the scent of an uncorked perfume bottle. And I'll just read the first part of that poem, I'm going to read it in French. So it's called Spleen. J'ai plus de souvenirs que si j'avais mille ans. Un gros meuble à tiroir en encombré de bilans, de verres, de billets boutous, de procès, de romances, avec de lourds cheveux roulés dans des quittances, cache moins de secrets que mon triste cerveau. C'est une pyramide, un immense caveau qui contient plus de morts que la fosse commune. Je suis un cimetière à bord et de la lune, où comme des remords se traînent de longs vers qui s'acharnent toujours sur mes morts les plus chers. Je suis un vieux boudoir plein de roses fanées, où gît tout un fouillis de mots de surannée, où des pa les pastels plaintifs et les pâles bouchés seuls respirent l'odeur d'un flacon débouché. It's the open perfume bottle. And a last quick thing. Even if my own inspiration was mainly furniture-based, the special quality of the topic is that it extends both in time and space to clothing as well and to the human body. And not only the human body. Here is my last quotation, my favourite psychoanalyst, Didier Anzieux, who wrote about the skin. And here he is talking about love. Um, that I've tried to say this is in English. And everyone knows perfectly well, unless they find it amusing to reduce love to the contact of two epidermises. He's talking about a 18th century aphorism. 
which does not always result, he says, in the full expected pleasure, that love has the paradoxical quality of bringing us, at the same time and with the same person, the deepest psychical contact and the finest epidermal contact. Thus, the three bedrocks of human thought, the skin, the cortex, and sexual union, correspond to three configurations of the surface, the wrapping, the cap, and the pouch. And it's interesting that in French, the word for pouch, poche, is also the word for pocket. So, and I translated this thing, uh, the book, and I, I was having to decide how to translate it. And I thought pouch worked here because he's referring to the especially sensitive cavities in our skin or our skin ego. But what he doesn't say is how such pouches make us all marsupials, as we'll discover later today. I remember when I was pregnant for the first time thinking, now I'm the purse of a person. There's a fantasy of maternal love in which we imagine being kanga to a roo who is both our possession and our excess. We'll discover more about this as we go on. So this is giving you a bit of a background, and I now just want to add to Anna's welcome, my own welcome to these three days of insides and outsides, containment, secrecy, and revelation. Jack is our only scientist. Jack is our first keynote. And he's also somebody from the muse world of museums. And we've already had two from different, very different museums. And um, I think this will complete that for the, for the opening day. We're very pleased indeed to have uh, Jack Ashby from um, the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. And from what I can see from his uh, uh, short bio, he's really a communicator. He communicates about where objects in museums come from, how nature relates to the unnatural um, and the history of, of, of the animal kingdom, I suppose. So today he's going to be talking very generally about marsupials. And I just wanted to add that his next book is coming out uh, in May, so in a few months. But it's about many of the things that he's going to be talking about today. And the title is Platypus Matters. The Extraordinary Story of Australian Mammals. And we very much look forward to both reading the book eventually and hearing what's in it now. Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I don't know if this, is, if this is one of those and now for something completely different moments. <laughs> um, but I have to admit, feeling slightly out of place um, because this topic of the conference obviously seems quite far from my areas of expertise. But I hope I can hold your attention and... Um, show you some of the things that I think are, are interesting and hopefully you will too, um, even if they are quite dissimilar to other things you've been discussing. Um, but if not, I've got a lot of pictures of um, cute animals, so there's that. Um, so, so just <laughs> as Mary said, I'm Jack, I'm the Assistant Director of the Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. Um, my kind of corner of zoology is, is Australian mammals, and their ecology, but also um, their kind of their place in the world, how they are represented to the world at large. <clears throat> And that is something I take over into how museums represent nature in the world at large as well is a, is a key interest of mine. So kind of the biases that the representation of, of animals, particularly but nature in general, in the, in the museums are framed by um, kind of the, wind, the, the uh, kind of unclear windows that they provide in the natural world. So my kind of my, my life, I suppose, my professional life is, is divided into three three corners one is three you know whatever three wedges um one is is running uh the museum um and so i'm not an academic in that sense um, or in any sense um but also uh that, that aspect of what museums do and then the other two thirds are, are a bit different so one of them is i spend a lot of time in australia uh supporting um field work for wildlife charities and universities <clears throat> so catching small mammals temporarily and then re-releasing them and the other third is is writing about all the things that i've just told you about so um decolonization is a another key area of mine not just in museums but in in natural history as well and we'll get onto that even though if you think i'm giving a topic about talk about kangaroo pouches i am but it's got it's got some wider implications um so with all of that background in mind when i was asked to talk about at a conference on the history of pockets and pouches and, and secret drawers. I wondered quite what Naomi thought I might say um, and the other conference organisers. So my brief, I think, is to share with you some stories of pockets in nature uh, and specifically marsupials. 
And thinking about it, um, some ways, uh, some some ways that these natural pockets uh, aren't so they aren't so different to human pockets. Um, just as people do, some animals keep treasured items safe and easily removable in their pockets. It's just that those items, in the case of animals, are usually their babies. Um, so I've decided to lean into the fact that I'm a zoologist and share with you some zoological stories. Um, however, these stories do very much have some significant social implications. Um, and I'll get to that at the end. So stick with me and I'll explain how our world today has been shaped by the way that marsupial pouches have been represented to the world. Um, marsupials are the most famous uh, porters of pouches in nature. And indeed the group's name, as I'm sure you know, <laughs> is uh, derived from, from pockets in, you know, or pouches. Marsupium is the Latin for purse. Um, so to understand how they're special, I should have started my screen sharing, I suppose. Um, understand how marsupial pouches are special, um, we need to understand what um, a marsupial is. So marsupials are mammals. There are three different ways of being a mammal. There's about six and a half thousand species of mammal alive today. Um, the vast majority, about 6,200, are placental mammals, um, like us, so that is a dingo here on the left. Um, placental mammals include primates, rodents, antelope, whales, uh, badgers, bats. Uh, the vast majority of mammals are placental mammals, and placental mammals uh, do most of it. Th these three groups are divided in basically how they reproduce. So placental mammals um, reproduced by having their babies do most of their infant growth in the womb, and then they give birth after a pretty long pregnancy, and then finish off their infant growth by suckling milk uh, on a teat. Uh, marsupials, there's a wombat in the middle, um, do the opposite. So they uh, give birth after a really, really short pregnancy to really tiny young, and then do most of their infant growth uh, suckling milk on a teat, often in a pouch, which is what we'll be talking about. <clears throat> and the third and my favorite group, uh, is one on the right, that's a, a duckbill platypus. Uh, platypuses and their relatives, the echidnas, um, lay eggs. There's five species of egg-laying mammal, um, and then they also do their infant growth by suckling milk on a teat. Uh, no, in fact, not on a teat. Uh, egg-laying mammals don't have um, nipples, um, but they do suck on milk, and uh, echidnas, in fact, have pouches um, too. We'll get onto that. Um, so, Placental mammals live on every continent on Earth. Uh, marsupials live in Australia and New Guinea and surrounding islands, and also it's about 100 species in South America and a couple of species in North America. And egg-laying mammals, platypuses only live in Australia and the echidnas live in Australia and New Guinea. So the kind of marsupial center of the world is Australia. Um, but Australia is the best place in the world because it's the only place uh, with all three groups of mammals, Australia and New Guinea. Um, so, just to help you orientate you to the marsupial way of life, um, here are a few preserved pouches from the uh, Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. So, the marsupial pouches come in different shapes and sizes. Um, some species have deep pockets, some are just little folds of skin on their bellies um, that offer a tiny bit of protection to their babies. And actually, some marsupials don't have pouches at all. Some open backwards, some open forwards, and some open in the middle. Um, these three, a wombat on the left, a kangaroo in the middle, and a thylacine, which is actually probably, this is probably the only preserved thylacine uh, pouch in the world. Um, they are extinct um, marsupial carnivores. Um, these are all deep pockets, but they've just been preserved in different ways. So the, kang the, the wombat has actually been turned inside out. And that arrow points to uh, one of its nipples. Um, that nipple is long, so it's, it was in use uh, recently before the animal died. Um, there is another nipple just here, which wasn't in use. Um, so marsupial nipples grow depending on whether they're being used or not. Kangaroos have four nipples, uh, and they're all tiny, so these ones weren't in use. And thylacines also have four nipples, um, but we can see the bottom two um, are in use, were in use when uh, the animal was killed, because um, they're nice and long. But interestingly, the two above are also a little bit long, um, I can't use my pointer because my camera's in the way. There. There's one there, and there's one to the right of that. Um, those nipples were in use 
not long before the animal died, but obviously they've uh, had two babies that have died at some point um, because they are bigger than they would have been without having been used. So that's just a few pouches, so you know what they look like. Um, when Europeans first encountered marsupials, um, as I'll get on to, it was, it was in South America in about 1500, um, South American opossums. The fact that um, their babies grow in enclosed spaces on the inside and the outside of their bodies um, gave opossums their scientific name, which is didelphis, which means two wombs in Greek. Um, that name is intended to refer to that second womb, uh, as it were, on the outside of the body, the marsupial pouch. But interestingly, uh, marsupials actually do have two wombs um, on the inside, um, a left uterus and a right uterus, um, which actually isn't as different to the human system as it might uh, seem at first. Um, like, uh, like humans, and all other mammals, females marsupials, female marsupials have two ovaries, you know, a right and left ovary, and two oviducts. Um, uh, in most placenta mammals, as I'm sure you know, these lead to a single womb, a single uterus, um, which has a single cervix and a single vagina leading to the outside world. Uh, in marsupials, by contrast, those right and left oviducts uh, lead to a right and left uterus, um, each with its own cervix and vagina. So. Uh, when marsupials become pregnant for the first time, they grow a third vagina, um, which leads from the point at the two, where the two uh, uteruses, you dry, meet. And then that third vagina leads down to the cloaca. Um, so most marsupials have a single opening, which is called a cloaca, for all of their waste production, reproduction, um, mating, birthing needs. Uh, so they just have kind of one hole. Cloaca is um, the Latin word for sewer. Um, so that third vagina leads down to the cloaca where the babies are born. In some species, that third vagina fuses up again after they're given birth, but in, in many others, like kangaroos, uh, it remains in place throughout their lives. Just to give you an idea of the, of the opposite um, situation in the males, uh, males have an repro interesting reproductive anatomy as far as we're concerned because their scrotum is in front of their penis, um, but their penis is also tucked inside their cloaca and just pops out when it's when it's needed. Um, but it's also got two heads um, to point towards the two lateral vaginas in a in the in the female. So they've got you know, the penis with two heads. Uh, so that's that's kind of an introduction to marsupial anatomy. And now let's take an exploration of life in and around that natural pocket um, for a baby marsupial. Marsupials have, as I mentioned, incredibly short pregnancies. The shortest are um, the shortest are just uh, ten or eleven days, so not even two weeks um, after. Uh, well, they, they, they're not. They're, not um, they're in the womb for just for just ten or eleven days, and even the largest species of um, largest species today, which is, is kangaroos, some of which are, are larger than adult humans. Um, baby kangaroos are only in the womb for four or five weeks. Uh, so when they are born, they are tiny and resemble minute jelly beans. Um, so the smallest mammal in the world, for example, is a newborn honey possum, and they're just five milligrams. So that's about the quarter of the size of a grain of rice when they are born. But what happens next is, I think, one of the most astonishing feats in the animal kingdom. Um, these tiny, tiny babies that have only been in the womb for a matter of days or weeks climb themselves, completely unaided by their mothers, from the birth canal up into the pouch, which for a, such a tiny animal is obviously a huge distance. And these maggot-like babies, when they're born, already have really well-developed um, arms and lips. And that's what enables them to climb and suckle, respectively. Um, so it's astonishing they have the requisite musculature, skeletal strength, nerve control, uh, et cetera, to allow that athletic um, feat. They can't see or hear. Um, and while we don't know exactly how they navigate uh, the route, they can smell at this age. So that's perhaps what they're doing. Um, so while the crawl into the pouch is utterly um, amazing, I'm going to hit play on this. This is some baby devils, perhaps baby Tasmanian devils in the pouch. Um, I think they're about two weeks old. Um, so you can see that the arm is, <laughs> is well developed, all five fingers on there, um, but the eye is still not developed. The back legs, by contrast, the tiny little nubbins down here, and that's the tail. 
um, curved around. So they're very much front heavy with really well developed lips and really well developed arms, but nothing much else going on. Um, this crawl to the pouch, this, this step in their life that is obviously so crucial to attach to a teat in the pouch has some major implications on marsupial evolution. Um, I should start by saying that marsupial lives, marsupial life forms are very diverse. Um, so just considering the Australian species, marsupials occupy every corner of that massive country um, in pretty much every, well, in a vast, vast range of ecological niches. So there are, or there were before their recent extinction, a full gamut of grazers, browsers, fruit eaters, nectar drinkers, truffle specialists, insectivores, scavengers, and predators large and small. Um, the smallest weighs just two grams, um, uh, which is a planigale. Uh, the largest until recently weighed uh, two and a half tons, which is called diprotodon, a species related to wombats of the size of a rhino. So marsupials' lifestyles are also diverse. Some can sprint, some can hop, some can dig, some can swim through sand, some can climb and some can glide. Uh, their habitats are diverse. They live on cliffs, in temperate grasslands, among boulders, in rainforests, cool and warm, tropical, in deserts, in monsoonal, monsoonal woodlands, savannas, in marshland and on mountains. But what they don't do is fly. Um, and while many marsupials are capable swimmers, including my favourite, which are wombats, um, no fully, fully aquatic marsupials have ever evolved. Uh, and the reason, the reason may have something to do with the fact that their baby needs to crawl to the pouch. So that grasping hand that they need to grab onto their mother's fur with is so important um, to marsupial survival that it's very difficult for evolution to modify that hand into anything else, um, like wings or flippers. So by contrast, in the placental mammals, relatives of hippos modified their hands into paddles and became whales, uh, and relatives of primates modified their wings, spread their fingers out wide, um, made them ridiculously big uh, and became bats. So the need to grip the mother's fur as newborns has potentially stopped um, this from happening in marsupials. Otherwise, we might have marsupial bats and marsupial whales. And in fact, there is one exception to that rule, uh, or the uh, key exception to that rule is in the bandicoot. So bandicoots don't climb into the pouch. They just, the mothers just curl over and the babies kind of flop out onto the pouch opening. Um, and so they don't need to use their hands. And that is one of the only groups of marsupials that has evolved anything different than a five-handed uh, grasping hand. And uh, one group of bandicoots called the pig-footed bandicoots evolved something that looked almost identical to hooves. So they're called pig-footed bandicoots. So we might speculate that because hooved mammals in placentals evolved to become whales and dolphins, um, perhaps the hooved marsupials might evolve to become um, marsupial whales and dolphins. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen because in the 1950s, um, pig-footed bandicoots became extinct um, because uh, Europeans introduced cats and foxes to Australia, which have uh, driven many species to extinction. It's the extinction capital of the world. Um, and so we'll never get those. Well, that's not how we're going to get marsupial whales in a couple hundred million years, sadly. Um, so returning to our babies, then, uh, after a couple of weeks, uh, of suckling, we reach this stage in the video. So as I said, these are about two weeks old devils. So once the baby has found a teat after it's got in the pouch, that teat, so you, you can see most of the teat here, and another one here, um, there are four. Uh, once, you've, once that baby's initially found the teat, the, tweet, the teat swells up inside its mouth. So that the early, in the early stages of development in the pouch, the youngster's permanently, permanently attached to its teeth. So very different to placental mammals, and the milk is actively pumped in, so it doesn't even have to suck. So just to kind of round up our tour of, of the steps of, of marsupial growth, um, here's a little bandicoot, again, a similar stage to those devils, so eyes are, are still clothed, in fact, they don't have eyelids, no skin, so it's very, this obviously very much looks like at the stage that a placental mammal would still be in the womb, um, but that's the, that's the pouch. Um, and then after a bit of that, these are some uh, northern quolls, marsupial carnivores. Um, these are a, a few weeks old, maybe a month old, starting to get fur. Um, they're still attached to their teats. Um, after that, they start to poke 
they start, they can remove themselves from the teeth and they just sit around in the pouch. So you can just spot the pink head poking out of this wallaby pouch down here. Um, and then the next stage is quite fun. They can stay in the pouch, but um, can start eating adult food, if you like. So this is a wombat. That's a wombat's mother's back legs. Her head is over on the right, some, over on the left somewhere. Um, but this baby is sticking its head out, unfortunately, right now into its mother's poo. But also it starts to graze um, at this stage. So they can, they can be very lazy pouch potatoes, just thought of that, um, and <laughs> graze past in their, in their pouches. Um, and then here's another devil, about four months old. At this stage, the mother might start to, to kick them out. So the babies can stay behind in a den while the mother goes out foraging. She'll come back and feed the milk. And in fact, that's what's happening with this baby. Um, because we pulled her pouch a bit. That's the baby's head down here. But she's got two other active teats. So this means she's got two other babies that she's left at home. But today, this one decided to be a bit clingy and go out with mum, while the other two have been left behind in the, in the den. So she'll go back to them and feed them um, in the morning. Uh, so they've got this great system in marsupials that like the womb, uh, pouches allow mothers to keep their tiny infants safe and, and with them. Um, but they, in Mosubio's case, they're tucked snugly in the comfort of a natural pocket. And that has some added benefits. Um, as the youngsters grow and begin to explore the world beyond their mother's pouch, um, her pouch can remain a safe refuge and a place to feed and sleep. So these are the legs of a baby kangaroo that has climbed back in, even though it's probably up to you know, up to kind of armpit height almost uh, on the mother when she's standing up. So if this this uh, Euro, black, uh, black wallaroo, is a bit bigger than this pouch young in here, but uh, it's sticking its head back in just to feed. Um, so it's too, too big to climb back in now, I should think, but um, it still continues to suckle. So <laughs> pouches are great because basically they allow their mothers to carry their babies without needing to use their hands. So let's get one thing straight. The placental system is not better than the marsupial one, which is often inferred, and I'll talk about this a lot as we go on. Um, it's very common to hear marsupials uh, described as primitive um, because uh, their reproduction is, is so different to ours. Um, so let me just say this, it's simply not true, uh, and it doesn't make any scientific sense. No, for a start, no two uh, living complex species can no no single uh, living complex species can be primitive. All living species are equally evolved, and specifically in this case, marsupials and placental mammals are kind of sister groups. So they are they split in evolutionary terms at the same time. So the two groups are as old as each other. So marsupials and placental uh, split about 160 million years ago. So. No group is, is better or worse than the others. Although, you know, subjectively speaking, I think marsupials are more interesting and are better in many ways. Um, but one of those people who have considered marsupials to be inferior to other mammals is a legendary uh, naturalist, at least among natural history people, called John Gould. Um, he uh, is a man that described Charles Darwin's bird collection when it came back from the voyage of the Beagle um, and did as much as anyone um, to bring knowledge of Australian mammals to Europe in the 19th century, particularly through his lavishly illustrated uh, Mammals of Australia, which came out in the 1860s. Um, and he described kangaroo reproduction as a very low form of animal life. Indeed, the lowest among the mammalia exhibits the first stage of development beyond the bird. Sorry, first stage of development uh, beyond the bird. Um, far from it. In reality, the marsupial strategy is, is fantastically sensible for raising young in an unpredictable environment. Um, if food or water becomes scarce, or if the mother feels that her life is at risk, um, uh, it is very easy, uh, if perhaps emotionally callous to our human minds, um, to put a halt to proceedings, and marsupials can simply eject the young before too much energy has become invested on it, if the mother thinks that's in her best interest. Um, this is much harder and biologically more costly to do from a womb. Um, there are plenty of accounts from colonial kangaroo hunts, which were kind of modelled on 
British fox hunting, um, that mentioned kangaroos removing their joeys from the pouch whilst they're being chased, leaving them behind, presumably to increase the mother's chance of escaping. Um, there are some species that uh, empty their pouches so readily that uh, when we're studying them, we have to take extra care to make sure the babies aren't left behind. And um, particularly there's one group called the betongs, which are kind of cat-sized hopping relatives of kangaroos, um, that we have to uh, use low-tack tape to temporarily close their pouches so that we don't leave their babies in the bags when we're behind um, when we're uh, working with them. Um, so today, perhaps the most common way of seeing marsupial reproduction described in journal articles, on TV, in, in museums, popular science books, um, is to say that marsupials give birth to underdeveloped young. Um, and as I describe, what people mean by that is that, that marsupials have very short pregnancies uh, because most of the infant growth takes place outside of the womb uh, on a teat. Um, as such, they're born at a far earlier stage of development than placental mammals. However, the word underdeveloped implies that they've come out too soon, um, that they have somehow failed to reach the level of development of placental mammals. Um, and it's another incorrect subconscious suggestion of inferiority. Marsupial babies are pre born precisely as developed as they should be, and they are less developed at birth than placental mammals, but not underdeveloped, if you know what I mean. So there's no, there's no hierarchy, there's no, they're different, but they're equal. Um, so next, I'd like to get on to a few of my favorite uh, stories about marsupial reproduction and marsupials and their pouches. Um, marsupials absolutely fascinate me, which is why I spend so much of my time chasing them around Australia. And it's, it's hard to describe the amazement when working with Tasmanian devils. Um, that's an adult on the left. You turn it upside down and look into its pouch. <laughs> you know, that sounds worse than, it, than I meant it to. Um, look into their into their rustic pouch and you find four perfect mini, de mini devils um, about the size of a mango. Uh, that are poking out of her pouch. You see, by this time, that size, they're far big, bigger than can fit into a pouch. Or similarly, catching uh, one of the devil's relatives, a uh, northern quoll, which are kind of um, long, ferret-shaped, spotty uh, marsupial carnivores that have eight babies, but not much of a pouch. Um, and those babies are so big that they're sticking out so that the mother has to run around on her um, tiptoes to avoid dragging them on the ground. They're amazing. When we, when we look at animal tactics across the animal kingdom, there are different strategies for ensuring that at least some of an animal's babies reach maturity. And many animals, like uh, many fishes, many invertebrates, um, frogs in our garden ponds, um, turtles, they all produce large volumes, large numbers of young, and then largely leave them to fend for themselves. They're playing an odds game. Um, if they have very many babies, there's a very good chance that a few of them will make it through the trials of infant life, even without any parental care. In other species, they do the opposite. Um, so mammals and birds, most, many mammals and birds, um, do, do it the other way around. So they produce very, very small numbers of babies and then heavily invest in, in raising them. But overall, there's a trade-off between the numbers of young you can, pre you can produce and how much parental care they can be given. And some marsupials, including Tasmanian devils and quolls, and um, make the most of both tactics, which I think is, is an amazing evolutionary stroke of genius. They, they use both tactics one after the other. Because marsupial babies are so tiny, by the time they're born, they've cost the mother very, very little in terms of energetic investment. So an eastern quoll, for example, is born after just three weeks in the womb and weighs 12 and a half milligrams. Um, so because these babies cost so little, they can give birth to up to 30 of them at once. Um, with a total weight of significantly less than half a gram. Um, devils do something similar. They produce about 20 babies, um, which are just you know, six millimeters long. Um, so the total litter weighs less than four grams. So which for an adult devil, so a female devil is about eight kilos, four grams of, of kind of newborn litter is, is nothing. Um, but there is no chance that those 20 babies in quolls or uh, in devils or 13 in quolls can, re can, can survive um, to be raised because eastern quolls only have six teats and devils only have four teats. Um, and as I said, when babies first attach to the teat, the, the tip swells inside the mother's mouth um, and then the baby is 
attached permanently for the uh, first part of their infancy uninterrupted. Um, so that means it's impossible for devils, for marsupials to raise more babies than they have nipples. Um, so the devil and quoll strategy is to play the odds game at first by having a significant overabundance of babies, and that maximizes the chances that four or six of them, respectively, um, will make the grueling journey to the pouch. And once the winners are in there and start growing by suckling milk, the mother begins investing the high levels of care that make it likely that they'll survive um, to weaning. So none of those other 20 or 30 babies um, can survive if they don't get hold of the teeth. So, but even with that number starting the race, we very regularly find nursing mothers that don't have all of their teeth occupied, um, which just goes to show how difficult that journey to the pouch must be. Um, so this demonstrates a hope that marsupial, uh, the marsupial pouch-based system is certainly not primitive or inferior to what we placental mammals do, um, which is what other people have often implied. Um, so moving on to what kangaroos do, which is equally astonishing, if, um, if conditions are good, kangaroos can, and wallabies uh, can employ um, a, a, a reproductive system that allows for a constant conveyor belt of baby production. At any time, they can have three generations in their care at once. So the eldest would be a large young at foot, like that black wallaroo picture that was sticking its head in um, to the pouch to, to, to suckle. Uh, so it would do a bit of grazing and browsing, um, and then periodically stick its, its head in to the, to the same teat that it's been using since it was a baby. Um, uh, and uh, the teats grow with, with the babies. Um, and then the next uh, baby would be an infant, like this one in the photo, uh, infant newborn, physically attached to a different teat that's far smaller and is producing a different kind of milk. So it's amazing that kangaroos can produce different kinds of milk for age appropriate babies from different teats at the same time. And then they have a third generation that would be an early stage embryo um, lying dormant in the womb, kind of pause, on pause. So kangaroos, uh, typically mate in the hours after giving birth, and the resulting embryo is then paused, waiting for a teat to be freed up. So once the young at foot is weaned, that teat will shrink down again, and the mother's hormones kick in to start the development of that third baby. Um, and then, in 2020, scientists discovered that one species called swamp wallabies um, take the strategy even further by having, uh, by ovulating mating and fertilizing a second embryo in their other womb um, when they already have an earlier developing embryo in the first womb. So that means that female swamp wallabies can be pregnant twice at the same time giving birth, uh, before giving birth to the older embryo. So throughout their reproductive lives, they are not ever, they are never not simultaneously uh, pregnant and lactating, which is pretty astonishing. Um, other species, of marsupial do the exact opposite to breeding many times continuously over their lives. Uh, they squeeze all of their breeding into a, into a single, uh, single explosive event um, and then die as a result of their exertions. That's known as suicidal reproduction. Um, it's the kind of biological story that the press enjoys um, quite a lot. The headlines uh, talking about this, this mode of reproduction in the press have included uh, doing it to death, uh, why a little mouse, a little mammal has so much sex that it disintegrates. Um, these newly described marsupials basically sex each other together to, to death. Um, sex, 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 and more sex, and then death. And what a way to go. Male marsupial found to sex itself to death after intense 14 hour mating sessions in its final plot line. All of those headlines are accurate. Among mammals, Suicidal reproduction is only found in marsupials. So in, in a few species of the, of the Australian carnivorous marsupials, um, like these antichinuses, and um, a couple of the South American opossums. So no male antichinus, fascagale, uh, or caluta will live to see their first baby. And the same is true for some species of northern quolls and dibblers. Um, what happens is all the females become receptive at the same time during a very, very small window. And at that point, the males more or less forego eating in order to get, dedicate all of their efforts to fighting other males, hunting for females, and then copulating frantically with as many of them as possible for up to 14 hours at a time. Um, these efforts see the males shrink by uh, up to half of their body weight. Um, and these events are caused by 
high levels of testosterone and uh, cortisol in the male's blood. Cortisol is a, a stress hormone. Uh, it causes the animal's body to break down into sugars, which for, fuel those frenzied sexcapades, um, but it also significantly compromises their immune system. So as they consume their own bodies, parasites and diseases take over, and it doesn't take long for their internal systems to collapse, causing their death in rather unpleasant ways. So in all animals, investing resources in producing um, and raising young comes at a cost to investing in the adult's own body and long-term survival, as I'm sure many human parents would attest. Um, generally, these trade-offs are spread out over an extended period over an animal's life. Um, but the suicidal reproducers have taken that compromise to the extreme, sacrificing literally everything for one breeding event. So, you know, live fast and die young um, is certainly the way for these species. But that maxim generally ends and leave a good-looking corpse, which really isn't the case for these species. Um, I've caught northern quolls, male northern quolls, uh, towards the end of the short breeding window, and they are balding, covered in scabs, sores, ticks, and other parasites, and like it says, you know, um, disintegrating. It's really horrible. And the males have evolved this way uh, in response to an evolutionary benefit to the females. Um, it's advantageous to the females to coincide the, the time at which um, they need the most energy, which is when obviously they have pouch young growing and growing and, and, and suckling, and to the point in the year when there's most food around the insects. Um, so they breed just in advance of when the insects uh, arrive and come into heat just for a brief window in the year, all at the same time. This has a knock-on effect of, of increasing the competition between the males. So if they don't mate in that short window, then they don't mate at all. Um, so it not only requires them to put energy into fighting for other males and wooing females, but also brings about something called sperm competition. And that's an evolutionary pressure uh, that can involve increasing the odds of fertilizing a female's eggs by producing more sperm than uh, you would need uh, each time you have sex than uh, if the females weren't promiscuous. The so females drive this further by mating with many males uh, during that short window. So sperm competition drives uh, the evolution of larger testicles to produce more sperm and correspondingly high levels of testosterone, which reduces the male's survival by, by breaking down their immune system. The testosterone is, is bad, a bad for your immune system. Um, essentially, the whole system is driven by the females. Um, they've brought about a modica modification in the male's biology in order to, to improve their own reproductive success. As I mentioned, they do all of this just before the food peaks in the year, so when they're giving it birth and lactating, there's plenty of food around. Not only that, this system means that all of the males are dead by that point. So they're not, the females aren't competing with any of the males for the food. So they can have the whole bounty to themselves. So it's, a, it's a pretty clever system as far as the females are concerned. Um, and when females mate with many males, they're gaining evolutionary benefits as well because um, it increases the odds that at least some of their babies will have the genetics to grow um, successfully, grow up successfully and reproduce for themselves. The so thinking about it the other way, if females only mate with, with one male, they're basically literally putting all of their eggs in one basket. So if that male turns out to be a dud, for want of a better word, um, then their young won't succeed. So as a result, um, females of many species often mate with many suitors and thereby bringing about the sperm competition I just mentioned. Um, and in those, baby, in those species that give birth to more than one infant, different babies in the same litter can have different fathers. And that can have a really interesting effect for this species, which is the Eastern quoll I've been talking about, that spotty relative of the death, uh, Tasmanian devil. Um, quolls are unusual among, or Eastern quolls are unusual, unusual among mammals in that they come in two very distinct colors. Uh, there's the golden fawn uh, with white spots and there's the chocolate uh, black uh, with white spots. So these are both the same species. Um, we can catch mothers of young with mothers with young of both colors in their pouch at the same time from different fathers. And a uh, year before last, there was a study that found suicidally reproducing northern quolls that had all eight of their babies had eight different fathers. Um, and this is a very sad taxidermy specimen of a, of a gliding possum or a gliding uh, marsupial called a feather tailed glider. Um, there are another marsupial that have, have litters fathered by more than one male. Um, and a species is also super social. It's, it's got communal nests with up to 25 babies. Um, and once, as once for, for many marsupials, once the young are too large to, to fit into the pouch, 
the mother leaves them behind in a den, as I mentioned, with the devils, um, when she goes out to forage and then suckles them when she comes home. In feather-tailed gliders, um, the females, um, females without young stay behind in the, in the den uh, while the mothers are out feeding to look after the babies. And not only that, when the mothers return, they often have another female's babies in her pouch, uh, suckling from their teeth. So that's a, a few examples to show that, that whilst marsupials are famous for their pouches, even though not all species have them, um, it's ast as astonishing are the details uh, of, the, kind of the way they raise their young outside of the mother's body. And there's so much more to, to reproduction, to marsupial reproduction than just the pouches. So next, I'd like to explore um, the history of early European encounters with marsupials um, and their reactions to them, because um, the novelty of an animal with pockets was certainly not lost on uh, early explorers. So the very first European encounter with a marsupial didn't occur, as I said, uh, in Australia. They'd been known in Europe um, since Vincente Yanez Pinzon, who sailed with Christopher Columbus as captain of La Nina before recrossing the Atlantic and finding what we now call opossums in Brazil in 1499. And according to uh, a translation of his description of the animals from the 1670s, Pinzon wasn't impressed by what he found. Um, nevertheless, in this, this is the first uh, known European encounter with the marsupial. He, he did manage to, re to report that key feature for which the group is now famous. He saw, as it says, a stranger monster, the foremost part resembling a fox, the hinder part a monkey. The feet were like a man's with ears like an owl, under whose belly hung a great bag in which it carried the young, which they not drop nor forsake till they can feed themselves. So despite that monstrous description, and apparently revolted by them, um, in 1500, Pinzon brought the animal back alive to Spain and presented her to King Ferdinand and Queen uh, Isabella who stuck her hand in the animal's pouch to find the three uh, shriveled babies that had died on the journey. And that is the beginning of a long history of humans sticking their hands into animals' pouches. Um, in 1629, the first European account of an Australian mammal is written by Dutchman uh, Francisco Pelsart, who met Tamil wallabies on an island of what we now call, off of what we now call Western Australia. Um, he is described, yea, worthy to note, under the belly, the females have a pouch into which one can put a hand, and in there she has her nipples. We have discovered that there in, the, that in there, the young grows uh, with the nipple in its mouth. And then in 1696, an account of the now famous grinning quokkas on Rottnest Island, uh, Vlaming found no people but a large number of rats, nearly as big as cats, which had a pouch below their throat, uh, into which one can put a hand without their being able to understand what, to what end nature had created an animal like this. The hands were not the only thing to enter uh, Australian mammals' pockets. In 1885, the director of the South Australian Museum, Wilhelm Hacker, wrote this of echidnas and their pouches. Um, I guess his assumption at the time was that pockets were for watches. Um, we find in my specimen one deep pouch, large enough to hold, although not wholly conceal, a gentleman's watch. Um, so, returning to the marsupials, those early Dutch accounts um, of the pouches were by no means well known among the British public, and it was not until after the British invasion of Australia that the details of kangaroo pouches became known uh, as part of the popular zeitgeist. And when they did, it included a rather dramatic piece of, of misinformation. So in 1793, Watkin Tench, who was a uh, diarist of the First Fleet, wrote, at its birth, the kangaroo is not so large as a half-grown mouse. I brought some with me to England, even less, uh, which I took from the pouches of the old ones. This phenomenon is so striking and so contrary to the general laws of nature that an opinion has been started that the animal is brought forth, not by the pudenda, but descends from the, jelly, from the belly into the pouch um, by one of the teeth. But this is probably the most widely read, from the most widely read uh, description of colonial life in Australia. Um, as Tench says, finding these babies uh, in the pouch led settlers to believe that kangaroos give birth directly through their nipples. Um, the phrase he used to describe them um, to people back in England were contrary to the general laws of nature. You can't get much more othering than that. So like Pinzon's monster opossum, 
They put marsupials well beyond the realms of normality and into the alien. And this is where it all starts. This is where this notion that marsupials are inferior um, and kind of generally not as good as other as placental mammals has come from. Um, placental mammals were used essentially as the zoological standard uh, and anything that, that kind of diverged from that standard has been assumed to be, to be um, inferior to it. And it continues to this day. So if, if I, when I talk to anyone about Australian mammals, which is most days, uh, people's typical response is, oh, that's so strange. Uh, if you look at pretty much any popular account of Australian mammals, it talks about them being weird and wonderful. You know, Austra everything in Australia is weird. It's a really kind of common way of thinking about them, which I don't think is said with, you know, any agenda. Uh, people are very fond of Australian mammals, um, but there is definitely a bias in the way that, that they are othered um, just because they don't do things like, like we do. There's a very Eurocentric bias into that, which I think uh, uh, has had a serious impact. As I mentioned, Australia is the, is the extinction capital of the world. Conservation is really hard in Australia. It's not federally supported very well at all. There is no legal requirement to protect endangered species in Australia. And I think a part of that uh, has to do with the fact that Australian mammals, even in Australia, are not highly valued. So again, people think of them fondly, but they do think of them unfairly as being inferior, that they're somehow uh, kind of biologically determined to, um, to go extinct. Um, and that is to do with how we talk about them. Um, but the importance of the way these animals and the pouch-based system uh, have been represented to the wider world goes beyond that conservation extinction problem. Over 30, 30 species have gone extinct since European invasion. Australian mammals, which is more than anywhere in the world by a long way. Um, the way that, beyond that, the way that Australian wildlife is portrayed hasn't just had an impact on its own perceived value. The colonial idea that Australia was fair game for European uh, imperial occupation and settlement was based on the concept that it was terra nullius or nobody's land, as um, you know, bigoted European invaders decided that indigenous civilizations uh, that they encountered there were too savage and civilized and primitive to have true ownership of the land. And I believe that uh, the perceived status of the people and the animals in Australia were fundamentally intertwined in the minds and the words of those colonizers. It, it served their political narrative to dismiss both the people and the animals as inferior because it augmented the arguments to justify the invasion. So one, um, I guess where we're putting that is by tying, tying the animals uh, and the Aboriginal people together in an ale alleged collective inferiority uh, it became easier to paint Australia as a primitive degenerative backwater. Through, through, the, through these denigrative written descriptions, the imperial establishment created a hierarchy in which Australia was made, in which Europe was made to look superior to Australia in every respect, the people, the animals, uh, and the climate. If that's all there is, was to Australia, then how could anyone object to Britain taking possession of it and overseeing its improvement as they saw it? And there's a sense uh, that even some felt that the colonization of Australia wasn't an invasion at all, but an act of benevolence. So in, in that way, the marsupial's natural pockets um, has driven them to be denigrated and undervalued of the world at large in a way that's had pretty profound impact on, on the planet and how, how you know, global politics are arranged. On a lighter note, just before I finish, I have one last thing to say about marsupial pouches. <clears throat> and until I was invited to give this talk, uh, I'd never really thought about pouches as pockets in the human sense. Um, they're an anatomical feature with a very specific purpose to carry you know, babies. Um, and while human pockets can be created for specific, in, in, you know, one purpose, like holding a watch or coins, in reality, I suspect it's fair to say that human pockets can carry more than one thing. So this talk led me to question whether the same is true for marsupials. Do their pouches ever carry anything other than babies? Um, and in my research, I came across one example. There's two different sources in which indigenous people in New Guinea have reported that ground cuscuses, which is this species of possum, um, of carrying fruit in their pouch. Um, but marsupial biologists have shared that information with, they're extremely skeptical that it's accurate. But I rather hope it is. Um, I'm going to finish there. Thank you. That was absolutely remarkable. <laughs> um, 
and pretty much all information that I should imagine most of us didn't have before. So thank you for that too. Um, well, we have a... Um, we haven't got a huge amount of time for questions, but um, we have 10, 15 minutes. Can I, can I ask something that's probably very stupid so you can sort me out? I've got two questions which may be all completely off the wall. Um, one of them is on the whole in humans and perhaps other of that kind of placental mammals, normally lactation and gestation don't coincide so there's a sort of not entirely but it's 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 the norm um and that seems to be very much the opposite here of, of when you describe the four different um infants at four different <laughs> stages simultaneously so can you explain a bit more about how that comes to be so opposite yeah it's because in in well actually in humans I'm not sure, I wouldn't swear that it, that it happens exactly the same in all the placentals, but in humans, it's the, the investment is quite long, it's an unusually long uh, mm. lactation period. And so the anodemic investment required to grow a fetus to term, which is huge, uh, and even longer than most other placentals, by compar you know, uh, relatively to body size, um, is, is too much to also feed a nursing young at the same time. So we have a hormonal, hormonal switch. Effectively, the, um, the, uh, the hormones that are in play during lactation, when they decrease, they make it more likely that for you to be able to uh, conceive. Um, I, I, that's how I understand it, but I'm not a human biologist. In marsupials, that doesn't happen. But the, you know, because the energetic investment in, in producing a baby in the, in the womb is so small, uh, it's relatively minute compared to the energetic investment into milk so they can they do do both at the same time at least in in many species of marsupial but yeah I'm, i don't take my word for it on that's how human reproduction works but that's my understanding yes and my other question was why why are the marsupials exclusively in australia and stroke new guinea good question i mean being islands <laughs> large island it could, you could see how it wouldn't spread, but why there and not somewhere else as well? So yeah, marsupials evolved in the Northern Hemisphere, so they used to live across Eurasia and North America. Um, and then they got into South America about oh, a long time, in ten, uh, I want to say 60 odd million years ago, um, at a previous, a previous time when North America and South America were connected. Um, pre the last, a previous time they were connected, they went from North America across the land bridge into South America. South America used to be connected to Antarctica. They crossed Antarctica, and Antarctica used to be connected to Australia until about 30 million, 38 million years ago. And that's how they got to Australia. As to why they extinct, went extinct everywhere else, uh, it's a, a very good question. And often it has been said that marsupials are inferior to placentals and couldn't survive amongst uh, the, the competition for placental mammals. That doesn't really stack up because Placental mammals live alongside a great diversity. Oh, sorry, marsupials live alongside a great diversity of placental mammals in South America. And about half of Australia's mammals are not marsupials. About half of them are placentals. Um, so it doesn't quite flag up, but, but we don't perhaps know what happened when marsupials went extinct in, in Asia, Eurasia, Europe and Asia. Um, Gosh. Um, Martha, are you asking? Yeah. Great. I, I have a comment, but first I want to note that I'm in North America and we have marsupials in our yard, which are opossums. So Absolutely. still some of them around. Um, they crossed back about three million years ago, two species of opossum, <laughs> Virginia opossum and southern opossum, um, crossed back into North America about three million years ago. But my, my, my real comment is about... Um, how they were imagining that they might um, give birth. Um, and I know this is far flung and not directly related, but in the Middle Ages, they were wondering the same question about the Virgin Mary because they thought, well, the Virgin Mary can't have given birth in the normal way because that's messy and degrading and, and so forth. And so one of the hypotheses was that she gave birth through her breast. 
And so it's it's an interesting conjunction with the hypothesis of the early uh, explorers because obviously they're thinking, okay, what other female thing could could give rise to a baby? You know, let, let's. Uh, I, it, the answer must be this. You know, so it's sort of reinvention of the same process. Um, if you can't have the normal way of giving birth, there's a sort of standard second choice. It's really, yeah, it's really interesting idea. Yeah, and it wasn't proven how marsupials did have they ever claimed to the pouch. Wasn't proven for over a hundred years. People who didn't know were still asking the 1880s how they could get into the pouch. But yeah, that's I had no idea about the story about Virgin Mary. That's fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, firstly, thank you, Jack. That was, I'm sure many of us will agree that that was such an unusual but like fascinating <laughs> topic. And I was really like enthralled and I've learned so much that I actually didn't know, but it was a really nice way to end the day. Um, it, again, it's maybe quite a simple question, but throughout when you were sort of talking about the kind of inferior status and you said towards the end that you kind of feel that that's still, you see that still today. And I was just thinking about like nature programs and David Attenborough and whether you kind of watch things and feel frustrated at the way that these creatures are portrayed. Absolutely. That is in fact the, the, the book that Naomi mentioned, Platypus Matters, that's basically what it's, it's about, saying please don't do this. Like yeah. so the last the last Australian bit, you know, blue chip David Attenborough documentary to go to Australia was was um what's it called? Seven Worlds, One Planet. Uh, and it it says exactly the same thing, you know. It's it's its tagline was along the lines of um, you know, marooned for tens of millions of years, the weird and wonderful wildlife in Australia has been kind of going out its business. But it's not marooned, like half of the mammals that live in Australia are placenta mammals most of the world's birds you look outside of your window pretty much every bird you see so songbirds parrots and uh pigeons all originate in australia they all flew out of australia and populated the world with song um the, the australia hasn't been removed so yeah, absolutely i get very frustrated about it you know you see in museums that call them you know australian mammals primitive the whole of primitive mammals it's yeah, it's completely unscientific. Um, mm. and Thank crazy. you. Thank you for a really brilliant <laughs> paper. I've just been reading, I'm I'm learning, I'm reading Hebrew, and I'm reading a novel in Hebrew about mm. mostly about pigeons. And at one point they say when the pigeon hatches out of its egg, its mother gives it pigeon's milk. Yeah. Do you know pigeons, this? Yeah, pigeons produce milk, so do some flies. Not they're not you know it's from crop it's from the crop in pigeons so they regurgitate it but they and it's oh, not it's like it's vomit it's effective uh, it comes oh. from a gland yes I guess I don't know what the definition technical definition of vomit is but yes it comes <laughs> up, up, the, up the gullet um, I think uh, at least yeah so producing milk is a definition of mammal that's uh, you know mammary yeah. yes. of, 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 of the name for mammals but yes. There are some other things that are said to produce milky substances and pigeons and some flies are among them. God. Somebody else? Questions? I think we're all a bit gobsmacked. I can ask a question. Oh, I should have raised my hand. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. Sam, please uh, do. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for that talk. It was uh, it was really fascinating, and I, I learned uh, learned a lot. Um, and I, I guess I was thinking of two things. One, with the extinction discussion, I guess the 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 idea that it's European imported animals or mammals uh, that uh, <clears throat> that have uh, driven the extinction. I suppose that's part of the narrative that uh, <clears throat> gets cited for the the primitive status. Um, uh, but the, I think that the question I have is, um, is about sort of, I guess, um, uh, marsupial behavior in relation to their pouches. Um, are, is there much study of how, um, like, how, how the animals care for their own pouches? Uh, what do we, what do we know there? So one of the reasons why my colleagues were very skeptical of that idea that ground cuscus is keep fruit in their pouches is that marsupials are extremely fastidious in the care of their pouch. So 
pretty much constantly they are licking them clean. Um, I don't, in the video of the baby devils, you might have seen it's kind of brown and sticky and looks really dirty. That's actually a anti antibacterial secretion they produce when they've got young, young, young um, in there. So they're, the pouch is a very kind of clean, sterile place and they're very careful of that. Um, and like, so obviously the babies are feeding and therefore also pooping uh, into the pouch, at least when they're young. So the mothers are, you know, cleaning out with their with their tongues and like th that was very raised questions for me like with wombats so wombat one over my shoulder so you can see it they're about a toy one um <clears throat> they're about this big and their pouches face backwards because firstly their legs are really short so in order to climb in the baby can't come in belly side because the mother's in the way so it's to come in through the back legs and also because they burrow if you've got a forward-facing pouch, it would fill up with earth. Um, so all I don't know is that when there's a large baby in a wombat pouch, how she can curve round to get her mouth into her backward-facing pouch. So I don't know about that, but I do know the babies turn around when they're older and you know, stick their back legs out and poop um, in the same way that they feed with their heads sticking out. So yes, they're, they're very, very careful about it. Um, It looks so uncomfortable, but I know that one is doing, asking a stupid question when saying, how does the animal feel about it? Yeah, I mean, that's, bit, that's just how they've evolved. I'm sure they, they'd say our way, it looks uncomfortable. You know? And if you carry a baby around for long enough, it's pretty uncomfortable, yeah. you know, <laughs> in your arms. <laughs> yeah. Or indeed, I wouldn't know, but, or indeed, you know, in your um, womb for nine months. Yeah. That's pretty uncomfortable, I think. <laughs> I think we're all going to go off and dream about marsupials. Oh, sorry, Lynn, if you'd like to ask something. Go ahead. Oh. She's gone. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, your talk was really fascinating. And um, I actually know a lot about marsupials because I have two daughters who are obsessed with them and all animals. So I knew they had two wounds. But um, uh, this is just a, a, a bit of an aside. They're, they were three years apart. And when the oldest was three, she said, mom, when the doctor took me out, why didn't they just take Maggie out too, right behind me? <laughs> so you might say that, you know, the kangaroo conveyor belt is a much more uh, better way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe it's more advanced than, than the human. I, than I the think human so. Form. That's all I've got. <laughs> I, think, I think so. It's, it's pretty astonishing. And some species, they, they make it slightly more complicated than I described. And they don't just wait for the teeth to free up. They wait for the teeth to free up and for there to be sufficient food in the environment um, for it to like, or as in the right time of year, um, for them to kick in. So that, that kind of frozen embryo, so it's a fertilized embryo waiting in stasis for, for the hormones to tell it to start growing. And they wait for, wait for the conditions to be right, either in terms of whether there's a free uh, teeth or in terms of whether there's enough food. It's really amazing. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. When you said females without young, um, I wondered, because it sounds as though these um, females are sort of pregnant or lactate or, you know, in the process, more or less permanently, were these older or younger? Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, okay. babies that have, some, sorry, mothers can obviously lose babies or they haven't reached their, um, their age of maturity. So if, if they, or if they just haven't happened to successfully reproduced okay. that year um so yeah it's not obviously not every not every animal has um babies every year um so it could be that could i don't know in the feather tail gliders it's the one i was talking about caring for other babies um i don't know the answer to that specifically but that would that would be my assumption do they have a sort of menopause i mean do they have a, a i don't moment? think so no um not many ma not many mammals go through menopause um, no mm. Well, I mean, uh, I think we sort of probably should wind up now, but uh, thank you very much indeed for that so interesting talk and, and to, to also the way that you brought it into the kind of cultural studies arena, which we've forced you in, into, but which you obviously work in anyway, it seems to me, <laughs> because you're talking about the history of the reception of marsupials and so on. So thank you very much indeed. And everybody, please Pleasure. give us another round of applause for Jack.